live in Vancouver, British Columbia, and uh, um, I've been involved with uh, psychedelics slash entheogens for many years in one way or another. And about five years ago, um, uh, as part of this conference that Tom just mentioned, uh, I was having a conversation with Kathleen Harrison, who some of you may know as the former wife of Terence McKenna, one of the great spokespeople for the psychedelics, until he died in 2002 or so, uh, 2000 maybe. Anyway, uh, and uh, <clears throat> I told Kathleen that I thought cannabis was getting short shrift as a spiritual medicine. That's the purpose of this conference, is to um, uh, share information, educate people on the, on the sort of wise, effective, responsible, um, uh, environmentally and culturally sustainable use of, of these uh, medicines like psilocybin and ayahuasca and uh, you know, peyote and others. And so I mentioned to Kathleen, oh yes, if more people would come and join me, I'd, 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 I'd be happy about that. Um, uh, and I, because I can't move um, because Jeremy's got me on film here, so uh, <laughs> I, it'd be nice to be more intimate with you guys. Uh, but anyway, whatever, whatever you're comfortable oh, with. Would you like this to be? Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez, on our first date, even. Uh, um, Find your drink later. Yeah, um, so uh, I was having a conversation with Kathleen Harrison, and, and I said something about that to her, that, I, that you know, that cannabis wasn't getting the attention it deserves um, and needs as a spiritual medicine. And she said, well, I think that'd be a really important book, and if you put it together, I'll contribute to it. Well, I know her some of her writing. She's never written a book, but she's written several um, uh, essays in other people's books and so on. And she's a beautiful writer. She's a really insightful person, deep wisdom person. And so that was kind of the trigger to go ahead with that project. So that was five years ago. Uh, I collected a total of 18 contributors to the book, including myself. I've contributed a couple chapters here and there. Um, got really lucky with my one of my favorite publishers, Inner Traditions, Park Street Press, Bear and Company, um, and came out in December. And so the purpose of the book, it may stand to reason, I guess, is to redress this issue. Um, you know, because for starters, uh, I like to point out, as does one of the contributors to the book, that cannabis truly does have an ancient and widespread history of spiritual use on this planet. Some of you may be aware of that, maybe not. Um, uh, for starters, uh, the lineage, the plant lineage that cannabis is part of or comes from, the Cannabaceae, I don't know if you know how to pronounce that word, I always pronounce it Cannabaceae, lineage uh, is estimated to be between 30 and 90 million years old on this planet. So it's an old, old lineage and plant. It's fairly obvious that cannabis has been deeply intertwined with human affairs as long as anyone could even imagine, let alone, you know, the actual evidence that we have. We know it goes back probably about 10,000 years or so in Chinese culture. In fact, researchers think that it might even have uh, originated in northeastern China. Um, uh, we know, for example, that uh, there are findings from the grave sites of shamans from the Neolithic era, which is about 7,500 years ago, uh, with cannabis residue. So it was clear that it's been used shamanically for a very long time, and it just stands to reason that it would have been even far longer before the, quote, dawn of civilization, because um, it was everywhere. It grows easily, as you know. Um, and people were using it for everything. They were using it for, you know, building materials, clothing, rope, netting, um, all kinds of medicines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, oil, you know, for cooking, for cosmetics, for painting, whatever, you know. Um, so, you know, it seems rather obvious that people would find out that you could get high from it too. And if you found that out, then at least some of the people would find out that if you sort of, as Terence McKenna used to like to say, sit down, shut up, and pay attention. Then, then you might find, which is again where the book comes in, uh, that there are some deep uh, um, spiritual awakenings uh, that can happen with the use of cannabis. Um, so the purpose of the book again was to acknowledge that, for starters, that w th this is what one of our the contributors to the book called the people's psychedelic. I've started using the term the people's plant. It's a little less uh, dramatic than calling it the people's psychedelic, although I. I do think that it belongs in the pantheon of entheogenic substances. 
um, especially when it's used carefully and sometimes, uh, you know, might require larger doses sometimes, but um, when it's used uh, very, very skillfully. And on that point, I'd like to say that uh, when it is really understood well, and oh yeah, I'm going to stop there, hold that thought for a second. I just want to make a little disclaimer for a moment. Uh, I don't know what this audience is. I mean, I don't know what your experience is, and obviously we don't have time to find out. So, you know, maybe you've had, maybe any one of you, maybe a bunch of you have had quite a lot of experience with cannabis in some sort of, quote, spiritual way. So I just want to say, I hope I'm not uh, talking obvious or down to anybody in any way. I'm just telling you what I think I understand and have learned and so on. So, um, you're so Canadian. <laughs> so I haven't apologized as many times as you have yet. <laughs> well, I wish there was more time because then I could tell you some, you know, Canadian jokes. Oh. Um, yeah, like uh, the New Yorker likes to make fun of Canadians occasionally. You know, they have those one-panel cartoons, and one of my favorites is the um, the, the caption is the Canadian Mafia, and it's um, a guy tied to a chair, um, and two guys standing over him in black suits with slick back hair, and ties and everything, and. Uh, they're both looking really tough, but the one guy says to the guy in the chair, he says, um, listen, you better start talking or Vinny here is going to say please. <laughs> <laughs> Canadian Mafia. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that's enough back talk out of you, buddy. Yeah. Um, uh, so, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, back to the story, as it were. Uh, uh, it has this ancient, widespread lineage of spiritual use. It has the potential not only to assist in our spiritual awakening, but to actually have a, a significant, powerful effect in our spiritual awakening. I truly believe that. And I don't just believe it, because on one level, I think that belief plus two dollars will get you a cup of coffee. Um, it has to come from experience. And although I don't make dramatic claims about my own personal experience, I've certainly had glimpses of um, what I would consider to be deep presence with cannabis. and. I compare that, in a sense, to other experiences I've had with the so-called major entheogens. So I, I know that cannabis can do that too. You know, I've, uh, like many of us, I've had moments of feeling like feeling a distinct sense of connecting to something that's you know much bigger, or when you might say even unconditionally true. Uh, um, and I've had moments of um, settling into. Uh, uh, what you might call the peace that passes all understanding, if you know that old phrase attributed to Jesus. Um, I think they said passeth, but that's okay. That was the King James Version, I guess. Um, um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, uh, so um, I'm going to jump ahead quickly because we're really short on time here. I usually make this talk about 45 minutes to an hour, and then we open it up for questions. So um, uh, there's a, a physiological or what you might call a biochemical um, rationale for how this works or explanation when I'll just give you the really, really condensed version tonight. Um, Joan Bellow is one of the contributors to the book. She talks about how when you smoke cannabis or vaporize it, uh, oral ingestion being different, of course, because it can take up to two hours to reach full effect. But if you smoke it or vaporize it, as you know, I'm sure, the effects are pretty much immediate. And one of the things that I don't know if you've noticed or not, I didn't really pay much attention to it until Joan pointed it out, uh, is there's an increase in your heart rate at the beginning. Um, and what that's doing is pumping an increased supply of rich, freshly oxygenated blood into the whole organism. And as part of that, and this is like I say, the, the, you know, the classic comic book version here, basically, um, uh, there's an expansion of the uh, mus musculature, uh, which he calls the oppositional muscles, allowing breath to go more deeply into the lungs, which again pumps more blood into the system, so that the whole system becomes what, again, Joan Bellow calls uh, result, the condition is uh, considered or de described as a charged equilibrium. A number of the researchers for uh, the talk about cannabis, such as Dr. Robert Melamede, use also the term uh, homeo uh, creating a condition of homeostatic balance. Um, I, I mean, I have to cut that one short. It's, it's a very bare bones description of that effect. So, but if, you, you'll, if we can go from there, the next question, in my mind at least, is okay, so then what do you do with that? The simplest way of condensing that down into a phrase or a couple of words is that cannab cannabis amplifies. Okay, that's the sort of the most layperson way you can talk about it. It amplifies. Um, <clears throat> so then, what do you do with that? It, you can say it amplifies or it energizes, um, and that's where, um, if you're talking about cannabis as a spiritual medicine or a spiritual ally, intention, 
right? Um, having an intention, having some discipline, having some focus um, for what you want the plant to do. One of the contributors to the book, Steve Dyer, says it's really important to him to know what he wants to use the plant for because it will energize whatever your intention is. And if I had longer, what I would say about that too is that that can also be why cannabis is harmful for some people, and I'm sure you know that too. People become heavily dependent upon it. I'm hesitant to use the word addicted because it's physiologically barely addictive, I think, but it can be intensely psychologically addictive or um, dependency inducing. Um, so if your intention is unconscious or if it's to escape, avoid feeling, avoid uh, uh, connection. Kathleen Harrison in her chapter talks about how she has seen a lot of people tending to be younger people, tending to be male, um, uh, who uh, get so cozy with the cannabis space they get into, they want to do it all the time and they don't want to come out of it into what she calls the daylight world of relationship and responsibility. So if your intention at whatever level of uh, consciousness or unconsciousness is to escape, avoid, not take responsibility for yourself, etc., 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 cannabis can go there too because it's an it's a scent in that sense neutral. It's a very gracious plant, you know. Um, but if your intention is to um, be present, uh, to wake up, to heal, so to speak, the amplification process or capability of the plant can can deepen or strengthen that intention as well. I'm sure many of you, if not most of you, if not all of you, understand that principle. So, um, again, this is the condensed talk, so I'm going to move right on to, if that's true, that it has this sort of physiological function, and then intention allows you to direct that amplification, that amplified energy, then what do you do with that? Well, um, in the book, um, I and some of the other contributors talk about how you can make use of cannabis in all your spiritual practices. I don't know if all of them is quite accurate, but um, the way I like to talk about it is that uh, you could apply the use of cannabis in conjunction with meditation and a number of other spiritual practices that range from essentially formless meditation or presence to increasing uh, degrees of form or activity or action in your practice. So uh, simply just sitting and being present, the aforementioned sit down, shut up and pay attention um, admonition um, is about as formless as you can get. Um, uh, Ganesh Baba, a crazy wisdom Indian guru, once said he had two rules for smoking cannabis. One is sit up straight with your spine aligned so that the energy can move. And secondly, dedicate your smoking to Shiva. That was his deity. So, but for us, it could be anything. Um, so, but that may be a little too loose, so to speak, for a lot of people, because cannabis as an amplifier can also amplify speed. It can also amplify thought processes. Most of us probably know as well, right? You know, get into the busy mind thing, or you think you're having the, the best creative thought ever, and you actually might be. But then, <laughs> it's also um, the tricky part about the thought stuff is that that, you know, I, I like to refer to Buddhist teachings. I was involved with Tibetan Buddhism for a long time. Uh, the, the way Buddhist teachings talk about the thinking process is that it's our primary strategy for avoiding reality, for avoiding the non-existence of the illusionary self, the ego, you know, that sees itself as separate from everything and just, you know, figures like you have to struggle your way through the world and protect yourself all the time and so on and so on. Um, uh, is it, th this is the ink cloud that we use to obscure that reality is our thinking you know the overlapping thoughts that create this kind of layers of curtains between us and and emptiness is the buddhist term for it they say that you have to go into emptiness before you you know come out into awakening uh, uh, there's a phrase that I often like to quote from Buddhism, which is, emptiness becomes luminosity. But first of all, we have to allow ourselves to empty of the old story, or the old stories that we, you know, have put a, put that by which we put together our, our whole life and that tell us what's right and what's wrong, what's true and what's not true and real and unreal and, you know, all that stuff and what we're capable of and what we're not capable of. Those are all the stories that live in our heads that we pick up from the time we're born and some would say from previous lives even. I don't normally talk this fast, by the way, but I'm trying to, I'm, be, I'm greedy, I'm greedy. I want to get as much as possible in in 20 minutes before Tom gets the cane that he's got hiding behind the thing there. Um, uh, so, um, uh, ideally, 
it would be great if your intention, if one's intention is to wake up with the uh, assistance of uh, cannabis, or you might even say the cannabis spirit, uh, to at least some of the time you're working with it, try to allow it to be itself without doing anything particularly. In other words, not putting on music or reading or chatting with friends or whatever, just being there with it. There's a phrase in the uh, Native American church which is, watch out for head traffic, because you have to surrender to those medicines. And people are casual about cannabis because it's so common and it seems to be more gentle and all that. But when you really relate to it in the ways that I'm talking about, it can be what a number of uh, researchers and experienced practitioners call a very advanced spiritual medicine because indeed in the ideal circumstances or the optimal I suppose you could say circumstances it can actually allow us to open up completely to presence and in fact uh, how to put this in a short amount of time because I usually just get to ramble about it for a while um, okay so maybe I'll just tell you this uh, this is again the condensed version um, you could think of the spiritual awakening journey from, say, beginning to end as one that, say, starts over here where um, you're living your whole life through the second-hand information of the stories, right? The narratives that you've developed that tell you who you are and what, and what everything else is. Uh, the journey of awakening is, from there is generally almost always gradually, I think, um, learning to trust um, unconditional intelligence of right now without concept. Buddhists talk a lot about concept, layers and layers of concept that we build up, right? And it's in emptying all that stuff and allowing ourselves to be fully present that we wake up, you know, and then we learn to trust that. Ideally, that's the, the path, is that we learn to gradually trust that. So you could think of cannabis as an energy medicine, that it allows you to deepen your entrance into the present, into the present moment. And then the more you do that, Joan Bellow in the book talks about it like that too, that the, that the, in some sense the high is almost a side effect. You no, know, it can be extremely lovely as most people who have experienced it know, right? But um, uh, it's also going to wear off in a couple of hours and you're probably going to be back at more or less at base camp again, right? <coughs> and where you started from. So the question is, is people like uh, the great uh, religious uh, scholar Houston Smith would say something like we're trying to move from altered states to altered traits in other words um, you know uh, uh, a spiritual life not just spiritual experiences mm -hmm. so um, uh, yeah he had another one that I just came upon a couple of days ago which was um, something like um, from passing illuminations to ab abiding light which I thought was really good as well um, so it's really a, a life journey and, and what cannabis can do in that regard is it can be a retraining process of trusting the moment. I, I think, it, as I say, it's really important for at least part of the time that one is doing one's practice with cannabis for that intention to try to be empty with it, try to just be uh, still, try to allow the thoughts to, to die away. Uh, fall away, not not with any kind of judgment, you know, just like what it is, you know, you know, you, you want to kill your boss, fine, it's just a thought, boom, you know, come back to, and then you're you're allowing the way I like to think of cannabis in that regard is you're allowing the plant to do its work unobstructed. This is where the avoid the head traffic thing comes in, right? If we can get out of our obscuring thinking mind. I always like what Eckhart Tolle said about that too, you know, the power of now guy. Um, he said, the ideal relationship with your thinking mind would be if you could treat it as a tool that you pick up when you need to use it, but when you don't need to use it, you can put it down. Unlike the way Buddhist teachings talk about the thinking mind as something that controls us in a sense, because we're using it to obscure reality. So. Um, the real short version is that um, you could do yoga with, uh, uh, pardon me, cannabis with yoga and a whole bunch of other practices, chanting, you know, sh sacred drumming, shamanic drumming, whatever. Uh, it can also support other um, uh, entheogens or psychedelics. Um, and if I had more time, I'd go into that too. And it's discussed by two of the contributors to the book um, who um, have used uh, cannabis successfully in conjunction with ayahuasca ceremonies. Um, because it has the potential to do several things. Uh, it can potentiate the effects of another medicine. It can soothe them or smooth them. Um, it can clarify insights. They sometimes uh, use it at the end of ayahuasca ceremonies for the sharing sessions. 
He goes, you know, if you have, if you do it, if you do cannabis in a sort of a clear, silent way, if you do, if you do cannabis in a kind of a clear, silent way, <laughs> um, uh, when you've already had these powerful medicines, you know, going on for a few hours, it can really help clarify uh, your insights. And that's the way some of these ayahuasca people use it. Um, so, um, yeah, just that, that cannabis can be a supporter. And I like to think of it as a humble plant that way. If you, I don't know, you maybe have had this kind of experience. If you take some, say, uh, psilocybin mushrooms, and two hours later, you have, at least this is my experience and other people I've talked to, say two hours later, you have a couple of uh, tokes. It's not going to feel like a cannabis high. It's going to feel like a mushroom high with this sort of little extra jolt or, whatever, or, or even that smoothness thing that I was talking about, right? So I think of it as a, as a, as a, um, a kind of like a bodhisattva. I've never used that term before to describe cannabis, but she serves us. She's, I see her as a healer. I see her as a, as a, a kind of a saint in a sense, you know, that um, if we can treat her with respect, if we can treat her as a holy medicine, as a sacred medicine, and, um, and give ourselves to her completely when we're with her. I'm not saying all the time, and I do want to say also that I don't, please don't take anything I'm saying as judgment against you if you're using cannabis daily. You know, that's up to you, of course. That's the people's plan, like I said, right? Um, uh, so, you know, we're, we are, should always be um, free to use cannabis the way we want. I would just personally hope that if I knew you and you were a friend of mine, you were using it beneficially in your life. Um, and the more attention we give it, the more respect, the more calmness, the, the more we pay attention to the setting, you know, internal and external, the chances are we're going to learn more from it. The more we can get out of our own way, so to speak, and just be there with her like she's a lover, like she's our teacher, like she's our therapist in that moment, you know. And then she can teach us how to let go into the moment more deeply. And, as you've probably discovered, since you're probably all cannabis people, she can also be a truth serum. One of the contributors to the book, Jeremy Wolf, says, pot leaves you naked, and the first thing you see is yourself. So people that don't like pot probably have that experience and go, oh, fuck, I don't want to. <laughs> I'm going back to my dominator mode, you know. Um, uh, so uh, it can humble us in allowing ourselves to see more clearly where we do make missteps, you know, where we are uh, perhaps in need of some corrective action in our, in, you know, in our way that we conduct ourselves so that she can tenderize us that way, she can sensitize us that way. Um, I could say a lot more, but I've probably talked more than 20 minutes already. Um, well, I mean, we, we open it up to discussion, so okay. there's still plenty more conversation. Oh, okay, had, good point. You know. Yeah, good point. Let me just say this then to sort of sum up the quote, quote, talk part of it. Um, uh, two of the contributors to the book, and, and I, um, I kind of agree uh, as, a, as a possibility, certainly not to make any kind of you know, grand statement about it, uh, that um, cannabis could be the sacrament of the universal religion of the future. Um, one of the contributors to the book, Stephen Hager, who was uh, editor-in-chief of High Times magazine for 25 years, calls it the sacrament of peace, you know, um, that if you use it wisely in your life and it's, you, you don't have an unhealthy or, you know, overly dependent relationship on the plant, um, it can um, allow us to, in a sense, soften up and soften up the the walls and the boundaries that we put around ourselves, connect with each other, connect with nature, connect with the spirit, connect with ourselves in that way. Um, so I just wanted to end my portion of the sort of monologue by suggesting that uh, in a completely non-dogmatic, non-hierarchical way that might only have, you know, two <laughs> two teachings in the whole book, like G Ganesh Baba, you know, sit down, shut up, and pay attention, McKenna thing, or sit with a straight spine and dedicate it to the spirit, you know, and then just try to be mindful and respectful. Um, this plant has the potential, if enough people use it that way, to make a big difference, I think, uh, in the way that the affairs of humanity are conducted. So, thank you. Coffee is still $2 in Canada. What's that? <laughs> we have Starbucks up there. Too. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, I got a coffee at a Starbucks today, and it was only a buck seventy-five.
Huh? Yeah, we just talked. Because it's not going to come up in the conversation over my, over my way in. But uh, just for a couple of minutes as a digression. Yes. Do you know anything? Does anybody have any experience with people who are supposedly, as we say, allergic to marijuana? Hmm. When you mean, you mean in a physiological way? I don't know because it's, it's like street language. Just, oh yeah, some people like you, they really do badly. I have like, um, 10 years ago, I had the first time in 30 years, I had some, you know, what's like the new extremely concentrated strain. Yeah. Five hours of right on the edge of vomiting, which is what mm. used to happen too. Yeah. And, and the internal experience is also really yeah. unpleasant. Okay, so um, that's, so like you've all, that, lots of that's a big question actually, or a big issue. Um, what is that? Does anyone never know anything yeah, like that? I, 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 yeah, have, it sounds like she's I have some pretty good experience with her yeah. name's Carla Kay. And I'm one of the three founding members of Scuff Farm Research, um, and we are um, the folks who decided to save uh, butane hash oil by publishing the plans and access to um, a closed loop system to make the whole thing a lot safer, and that's kind of where we are today. But um, we started as, you know, of course, medical cannabis. And um, experientially, I personally have never gotten sick from cannabis, but what you did was overdose. It's not an allergy, you overdosed. When you overdose on cannabis, and that overdose is different for every single person depending upon your endocannabinoid system and your situation and your surroundings. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things come into play. Yeah. So what happened to you is you just took too much. You're lucky you didn't throw up. I've watched people puke for 18 hours. Oh. And, and that can happen, especially when you're doing those concentrates. Yeah. But some people have such a light tolerance that they can throw up even smoking cannabis. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does Did that, you do, does that yeah. make sense? I, I agree well, with the sense you. Is that it, but at the same time, I also would throw up in the 70s like, it was like from like 72 uh -huh. or 3, 75 yeah. is when I first used it when I was a kid. Okay. And well, I just stopped because it was so bad. Right. And I tried it once again because I was around this guy who was, I was actually helping him harvest it. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. uh, but in the 70s, I also did have mm -hmm. a vomiting experience. And it was always the same thing. It was like I had three specific instances that mm -hmm. were great. Yeah. And several dozen times where it was either just unpleasant or just downright nasty. And that could be strain driven as well. Absolutely. Um, so if you, like there are a lot of people I'm included, have ten, um, more tendencies toward the indica strains because they tend to be more medical, more sedated, more calming where the sativa strains tend to be more racy, mm -hmm. and those are the ones that can give you the overdoses the quickest. And yeah. so you have to understand, particularly in the 70s, where it was not a legal drug, <clears throat> the growers wanted to make as much money as they could as quickly as they could, and so they'd harvest a week early. Well, in harvesting a week early, your trichomes are clear, and they're very, very racy, and they can put you into an immediate anxiety attack. Mm -hmm. yeah. So here again comes comes what we talked about, Stephen talked about with respect to intent. In the very beginning, you know, it's like, okay, you pick the strain, then you decide how long you maturate the, the, that plant, how you're going to cure it out, how you're going to extract it, how you're going to process it afterward. All is, I mean, it's all critical. You can make a cannabis medicine that will do pretty much anything, but if you want to make a really good sleep medicine, you pick a nice heavy um, um, indica strain, like uh -huh. maybe White Widow, and you maturate that plant out to, you know, hey, grow it for 10 weeks, you know, so that all the trichomes are nice and golden, the plant is decarboxylated on a natural basis. And then you take that plant and you can extract it uh, warmer, and that will continue to, to um, decarboxylate the plant, i.e. Um, um, convert the THC to CBN, which makes it more sedative. So there's a whole bunch of things that go into it, and man is intent important. Absolutely. Very, very important. Yeah. Whether you're making a medicine for someone who's sick, or whether you're and, you know, heading out to the movies and you certainly don't want to fall asleep, so you better not be taking that indica, indica strain that I grew out for 10 weeks. You want, you know, something that's more sativa-based. So intent is really, that's 
probably one of the most important things that you said that Good. so many people miss. Indeed. So um, uh, I'd, I'd like to make a couple of points or comments at least about what you're saying. Um, one is that sort of in line with what you're saying, the, the research now is just really blowing me away. I've been to some of the conferences lately, like the Cannabis Hemp Conference, and it's really remarkable, the, the, the rapid development in research now. Not only, it's, it's, it's gone way beyond the sativa indica continuum okay. issue. Um, uh, it's, yeah. it's the CBD is having a big effect on it. CBD has anti-anxiety effects, it has calming effects, it has antidepressant effects, in, and they work, it works uh, synergistically with THC as well. So the two of them work together. For, for those who don't know, there's only, uh, you can only have like X amount of the two, those are the two um, predominant <coughs> cannabinoids in the plant. And you can, if there's more THC, there's going to be less CBD and vice versa. There's only room for like, <coughs> you know, in the same plant. So there's that. But then also as Dr., were you there for Dr. Ethan Russo's talk? He's amazing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And he yeah. went through all a bunch of the terpenes. And, uh, and so the for example, myrcene. Are you familiar with myrcene? Yes. Yeah. So um, the reason they think that now that um, the indica strains tend to, it's not the, that they're indica per se, right. it's that they t more likely uh, to have myrcene in them, which is a terpene which causes drowsiness. Um, so, uh, and this is, but what both you and I are saying for you is predicated on your interest in actually exploring the issues. But if you are, I would say, you know, talk to people at a dispensary or some kind of store that, that really know what they're talking about because there are so many combinations now. Um, you know, you can do pure CBD strains that have no psychoactive effect, although some people say there's a little bit. Um, uh, uh, Martin A. Lee, who's a, an expert, is the head of Project CBD, um, uh, he's, he, he's, he's found that uh, uh, plants with a two to one in favor of CBD, two to one CBD to THC, um, uh, give him what he calls a heart high, you know? He said it's not a head high, it's a heart high. Um, uh, so, there's th so there's that. And then the other thing I wanted to say to you, um, sir, um, is that, yeah, I, in case you didn't know I was addressing you, <laughs> um, is uh, this is a little more questionable of me to say. It's just a suggestion as a possibility. Um, because I've actually seen this uh, manifested with other symptoms, not specific, not necessarily nausea per se, um, but uh, cannabis has the potential to be an ego dissolver and um, uh, nobody really wants their ego to be dissolved, right? You know, it's like my old Buddhist teacher said, yeah, you could lose your wallet, you could even lose your wife, but your ego, no. <laughs> you know, um, uh, so um, it's almost universal, if not universal, to have some fear associated with the dissolution of this package of ourself that we've put together, right? It's a threat to the status quo, and the ego is extremely clever. It will come up with anything it can do to try to protect the status quo, and that could include dizziness, nausea, etc., etc., panic attacks, paranoia, all that stuff. So it is possible, I have no idea if it's true, but it's possible that that's been your um, uh, at least part of that may have been your reaction to the threat to the status quo, even though you may not have been conscious of it. Um, and so then the question again for you, if I may say so, is whether you want to explore that, you know, using cannabis anymore in your life, you know, there's, nobody's going to make you, obviously. Um, but if you were interested, you might explore different kinds of strains that can be more gentle and also, as this woman was saying, <coughs> dosage is key. I, it's addressed in the book, actually, by several people, including myself, which is this idea that less is more, you know. Um, uh, yeah. And I, I, I caution people, you know, that if they're not familiar with it or if they're having trouble with it, but they're still interested in working with the edge, to start with very, very small dosages and find out where you're, you know. I, I, at one point, I think I, I think I said in the book, that one way of thinking about the, what you might call the optimal dosage of cannabis, if you're using it as a spiritual medicine, is the dosage that you both can and want to handle. And that could be the lightest gentle dose, or if you can handle it and you want to go deeper, to go deeper, because sometimes more is more too, right? Anyway, that's enough for me. Um, yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you could share some of your favorite tools for getting out of the head trap. Getting out of the head trap? 
Yeah, you know, that's, that's, that is the giant question for humanity, really, you know? It is. The and, people's and, question. You know, there's no, there's no way around it, you know? You have to put your fucking feet in the fire, period, you know? Yeah. Um, I, I work with ayahuasca a lot, and um, uh, <clears throat> lately, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Santo Daime Church? Yeah, I've, I've hooked up with some Santo Daime people up in Vancouver, and what I've found working with them is it's real, they create a really good container. It's really straightforward, it's really simple, and what I find is every time I go in there and drink that ayahuasca, um, my relationship to whatever you want to call it, you know, truth, God, whatever it is, um, that unconditional reality is naked. Um, I see my resistance, I see my whatever level of willingness to surrender I have, um, and I watch myself uh, trying to escape it. It's like anywhere but now, you know, Eckhart Tolle says that too, he says, the now is never enough. Nobody wants to be in the now because it's, it's nothing. You can't be who you were anymore on some level. Does that make sense? You know? We, that's what the ego is in, you know, sort of Buddhist or psychological terms, is this, um, this uh, uh, narrative uh, configuration, this package that we've put together that, and, and it's not to be judged in any way because we needed it to survive, you know, like everybody has to find a way to make themselves something that can, that can survive in this world, you know, survive psychologically, spiritually, emotionally in this world. But um, at a certain point, it, it starts to hold us back. You know, so um, there's nothing other to do with it. I don't think than just keep working with it. You know, you ever heard of the poet Rumi? The yeah. Okay. So Rumi says something like in one of his little quatrains, he says, uh, <coughs> um, "Ours is not a caravan of despair. If you break your vow a thousand times, come back, come back, come back." And the way uh, the simple follow the breath meditation was taught to me in the Buddhist environment was it doesn't matter how many times you go into thought, it doesn't matter if it's 60 times an hour or more, just don't judge it. As they used to say, no praise, no blame. Just notice it. Oh, there I am thinking again. It doesn't matter. You're thinking for two seconds or 20 minutes, you know. At some point, you're going to... Well, we generally, we don't, it's like falling asleep. You don't know when you're falling asleep. You don't know, usually, when you're going out of presence, either. But at a certain point, whether it's just because you notice it or because somebody coughs beside you and you go suddenly, oh, yeah, right, I just planned out my whole week tomorrow for tomorrow, you know, for, like, for the next week or whatever. Um, uh, you go, oh, okay, I've just been in my head all that time. So you just acknowledge it without judgment and uh, come back to being present again. In the meditation technique that we were taught, it's just gently following the breath because the breath is um, unconditional in a sense, right? There's no intellectual component to that. It's just real. So um, I don't think there's anything else you can do other than just work with it, you know? Uh, in the book, I talk a little bit more about how if that naked presence is too much to handle, um, you know, adding more form with, say, chant, um, you know, uh, whatever. Uh, sacred song, shamanic drumming, guided visualizations, you know, can help. I had one guy in a ceremony, I sometimes lead ceremonies of cannabis, and I had uh, one fellow just was, I, we did a guided white light meditation thing, you know, and he just went, it just totally blew his socks out open, you know, just blew the whole system open for him. Um, so I would just say uh, perseverance, um, non-judgment, and just keep coming back to the wellspring as often as possible in your life. It, it, you know, I, that's why, you know, 2,500 years of, of Buddhists said, you know, sit down, shut up, and pay attention. Because you actually have to, have to, have to work at it. Most people have to work at it. Um, but the point is, no matter how, yeah, a lot of people say, hey, I can't, I can't sit still. I can't meditate. You know, I have a too busy mind or whatever. Um, but I think that's selling yourself short. No matter how busy your mind is, I think the point is of 2,500 years of Buddhist and other teachings, or however many thousands of years, that, um, <clears throat> that everyone, you know, in, again, Buddhist terms, has Buddha nature and is capable of waking up, of seeing through, you know, this series of stories that prevent, this, prevent us from seeing reality. So, how do you how have do you faith. Do you how do you, <laughs> how do you I would say your ayahuasca? just art and magic. Pardon? That's a that's how you get out of that. Say that. Say what? In answer to the young lady's question. The qu the answer was art and magic. Art and magic. Okay, cool. That's I like to focus on my emotional body as one way of getting out of that. I beg your pardon. 
me, one way of getting out of the head trap is focusing on my emotional body. Mm -hmm. What does what that mean? Feeling right now? What does that mean? How do you do that? What am I feeling right now? Oh, okay. Question. Yeah. Without looking for a word to be the answer. Mm -hmm. For the exploration of the emotional yeah. state. I look at what I'm watching, you know, it's yeah. like, okay, what am I watching, what am mm -hmm. I seeing? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think if you think of, you know, if you would sort of even tentatively, you know, proceed on the basis that if, if you're having difficulty quieting the mind, it's because uh, you're obscuring something, right? If you're obscuring that reality in yourself, and so there's no other way around it than just to keep working with it and have some kind of tentative faith or confidence that perseverance will produce results, you know. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, we all just have ourselves to work with. It's just energy, right? Yes. Hmm? Okay. So, um, what strains would you recommend? Well, that's an interesting one, and I tried to talk about it a bit in the book as well. I don't think there's a simple answer to it. Um, and again, in terms of what we were talking about a few moments ago here, it, it, it's, it's such a complex plan. It doesn't come down to the sativa indica thing anymore, you know. Um, I read that there are over a thousand chemicals in this plant, and that and that a number of them, a fair number of them, are unique to the plant. You know, and all these terpenes, you know, that I mentioned, like myrcene, they all have significant effects on the whole thing. So there's this um, entourage effect, is what they talk about. Um, uh, and really, the only real answer to that question is experiment until you find a strain that you like, and then make your fucking dispensary keep producing it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Has anybody experimented <coughs> with high-level doses of CBC or CBAs? Of what? CBC or CBAs? I'm not very. I've heard these, but I'm not very familiar with them. But yeah, they're working on the researchers are working on yeah. them. Yeah, um, there isn't any results. There are some logistical knowledge. problems, you know. Trying, you know, I mean, if you think about the, you know, the people that are growing, you know, do they have the capability of isolating and manipulating all these complex chemicals, you know, sure. and then re reliably reproducing it the next time too? You know, it's a plant for God's sakes, you know. Um, uh, some people feel that. And I, I think I'm one of these, um, that uh, the qualities that this woman was referring to of sativa being more sort of sharp and up and all that um, are more conducive for um, uh, meditating, even though they can be um, provoke thought more. Um, because they're more up, they're more awake, more energizing. That's my experience. But, you know, I'm older too, so my body's different, and um, I don't want something that's going to make me drowsy or sleepy or heavy or in any way, you know. That doesn't work for me, you know. I could have a nap, you know. Um, so. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. I just want to say that I'm really glad I came here because what you're saying is lines right up to my experience because I've been using marijuana the same exact way that you're describing oh. for spiritual purposes. And then my, my purposes are probably different than any well they are different than anybody's here and I and if I start talking I'll, I'll probably get emotional and that's fine I, is it okay that's cool yeah. too yeah. Yeah. yeah this is that space dude yeah okay. mm -hmm. because <laughs> Somebody I don't the need the drug to, I, don't, I don't need the drug to connect to her I and she's with me all the time mm. Hell yeah. and and uh, mm. I what Beautiful. I use the drug for is is when I get home and and when marijuana really comes in good for me I mean the, let me describe my relationship with her. Yeah. And, and she comes to me throughout the any time of the day. She wakes me up at night, and she fills me with a love that is so strong that it causes that I cry sometimes mm -hmm. for joy. I just weeping for joy. Yeah, and this happens at work. It happens. It, it doesn't. It, I don't have to be high. Mm -hmm. and, and so it happens all the time. And this has been going on for a year. And, and it's not anything new. I've had this relationship for a long time. I've had it. 45 years, but it was kind of like 45 years ago I've had it and it's kind of was on the skate for about 30 years and a year ago it came back and just, and it's been like this for pretty much nonstop for the year. Mm. But where I use marijuana, where this is really good is that marijuana does open up that door a little bit to her and that's what's really cool about what because it is a female personality what you, what you run into. She's very, very uh, nurturing. You feel like you're curled up into her arms of love and it's, it's sometimes when I smoke, uh, I'll, I'll just sit there for hours. I'll just be this complete union with her. And it's just like tears just falling through my eyes. And just like, and, and it's just amazing. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, you for sharing. Kat Harrison's essay, who is, in the book, Who Is She? I think you'd really dig it. That's what I'm saying. I'm, yeah, I'm really, really happy that I, yeah. that I came here. Cause here it's my favorite one in the book. Wondered, 
person. I've been, I've been kind of mining these no fields on my own, <laughs> on my own, and then come here and hear you say yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. That is yeah. validation. It's very yeah. validation. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank and, you. I, and the thing that you said, I want to find out more about what you said about the sacrament of the new religion, because I do think I have an idea yeah. of the new religion. I, this whole year, I've got a whole religion, basically. And so, when you say about the sacrament of religion, it makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Because it does fit into what I'm experiencing now, my, personally. The only thing I would caution personally, it might sound a little bit pretentious to say so, but I hope not, um, is please avoid dogma and hierarchy in creating yeah. any kind of structures for working with this plant. We've seen enough of that for the last few thousand years. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and, and in fact, that, that's the spiritual revolution, as I understand it, that's going on now, yeah. is that is we're taking back our spiritual awakening empowerment or power for ourselves with direct experience. I mean, that's why I, I got interested in these entheogens altogether in the first place was because um, you know you can't get awakened through somebody else I mean they can guide you of course you know they can teach you etc etc but the plants deepen your direct connection if you use them properly you know if you use them effectively so um, I think the spiritual revolution that's going on now is that we're starting to learn that we are responsible for our own awakening completely you know that we are our own authorities we are our own teachers in fact one of the Buddhist teachings that came my way was at a certain point of the path, the guru, the no, how did he put it, the phenomenal world becomes the guru, right? It's our own relationship to the world that teaches us. All we're seeing is our own, ref the reflection of our state of mind, always. We're always seeing a reflection of where we're at. So if we're seeing from peace, then I think the Zen's guys, guys say something like that. When you sit down, when you sit, the whole world sits with you or something to that effect, you know? When you're at peace, the world feels peaceful. You know, even of course, you know, the same stuff's going on, but you're experiencing it from a state of peace. So I think that's the spiritual revolution that we're undergoing now that needs to happen if we're even going to survive on this planet. Well, can yeah. you speak more about uh, the revolution? Or we've been in this for a long time, so. You know, what's happening now as far as the number of people that are opening up to this and then, mm. and then also uh, I guess you give workshops so how, how do those go you got people coming in I, I don't give workshops but I lead um, cannabis ceremonies occasionally in fact um, Am I allowed to mention this in this context, or is it already settled at it, private? It's already or? settled. Okay, yeah. But I do occasionally um, uh, uh, lead small groups like this. You know? So you have new newbies coming in to do ceremonies? Yeah, but this is up in Vancouver. <laughs> so you'd have to make the journey to Vancouver. <laughs> but you'd be welcome to be in touch with me if you want. Um, yeah, we've been doing them two ways. We've been doing them um, uh, more or less all day, where we have an edible involved, because then it goes on longer allows you to take your time more with the different uh, my um, my key thing is uh, as much as possible I want I want us to have the possibility of just being empty with the with the plant like just sitting meditation you know when I the first couple that I did um, I wasn't sure how much they, they were all people I knew you know and they were all people that had ex previous experience with entheogens and with cannabis but not that way of using cannabis necessarily um, but I didn't know you know could they sit for 10 15 minutes repeatedly you know or could they sit for half an hour you know without having something else going on so every 10 minutes or so I'd sort of interrupt them and get out my big Tibetan gong and go like this or something or you know play my little thumb kalimba thing or um, or start a chant or we had a yoga teacher lead us through some stretches and so we just broke it up a lot but what I found was that a lot, you know in general people could sit for half an hour or more um, just silent sitting meditation watch the thoughts come watch them go um, and just keep coming back and at the end people were saying things like wow that's a totally different way of relating to cannabis than I've ever done before you know, um, people were saying, I had a problematic relationship with this plant. I didn't even want to do it anymore. But that's the way you can get into your head with it, right? The amplification of thoughts can be very negative. That's a whole issue as well, like for young people and so on that are really ins really sensitive, you know, being careful about what thoughts you buy into because it's exaggerating the thoughts potentially. Um, as far as, you know, how, how fast this sort of revolution is developing, I don't know, Tom, you might know more about that, I, that than I do. Just um, to, from a, a cultural standpoint, what it looks like, and I'm not sure because we're still all waiting to see how this unfolds, but it seems as if the spiritual revolution that Stephen brought up 
was going on and there was this other thing called the psychedelic renaissance also come going on and they've just kind of collided in the past couple of years and i think we're all just kind of wondering what's gonna they're, they're both kind of playing in and out at least from from what i can see in my perspective of it and you know doing conferences like what steven talks about and going on tour and you know really um trying to be a part of this, this thing called the psychedelic renaissance and it seems like there were just a, a, a few movements are also kind of and also kind of like the neo-pagan and witch community is also really you know it, it's uh, I think Stephen said it best it's this this common denominator of your own you know ideas of spirituality and it's just like that that idea that you just you're just gonna decide for yourself you know what you want to believe in experience you for yourself yeah, yeah. an experience for yourself yeah. and what yeah. you you know would call it but that's i don't know but that's just my take on it but yeah. I, I know, this yes i just think i want to contribute from what i'm reading that are things that are concerning me one is that um the, the organization that appears is kind of a spawn or a you know an outgrowth from is called maps.org yes very familiar San with them yeah, yeah. So they're doing really above board research mm -hmm. using especially MDMA for trauma. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's coming down the pipe there. It's giving it to 500,000 or a million veterans who are guys who voluntarily got into the military and came back traumatized. Yeah. Um, so it's going to be very, it's going to be like um, like Prozac where just everybody's just dispensing. Are you talking about cannabis in particular? Well, I'm thinking like any of the entheogens. They're focusing on MDMA, MDMA right MDMA, now. Yeah. But they're also going, you know, like they're resurrecting the fact that Hoffman immediately th thought that LSD was clearly uh, a psych med. So there's yeah. the history of there. Um, yeah. People have known that that no, was used to. He didn't really know what, well, this guy wants What's to that? say something, but he well, didn't. Let, 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 let this gentleman to finish his thought, though, if I may, if we could. Yeah. So there, it's just like the, the, the therapist community is looking for these as ways to treat people on mass. Yes. And I don't think that's good hmm. in the sense that it's hmm. going to be used just as an odd, like, like automatic, like the intent is going to be just fix them because we don't have the time and the person probably is not in, you know, emotionally mature enough to really sit with their shit. Mm -hmm. yeah. The other thing that's happening is that um, Silicon Valley is really big on microdosing so they can be more creative, more more productive. Yes, indeed, yeah, yeah. High-tech machine, yeah. machine, right? Yeah. And the other thing is just that, like the same thing with the entheogens, um, Therapists are trying to prescribe mindfulness just as a practice in the same way. It's just fix yourself. Yeah. And um, um, it's kind of part of waking up, though. Yeah. Are you? Are you? Because it's. Yeah, I'm just saying they're using it as a mechanical kind of a treatment. Like you, you, whatever is in there, just fix it by using meditation as opposed to understanding like the core of meditation is like the end view of it and sort of mm -hmm. yeah. is not a, is a misnomer, it doesn't generate anything, it actually reveals. So well, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed that um, like this, groups like this might be the one place where people can kind of keep that more original notion that there's something much more to it than just psychological health yeah. or that it's just um, Another, another technology. Sure. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, difficulties to make to make things easier. Mm -hmm. like your sin, make yeah. you feel I don't have a comment on that. I, it, I it does also mostly help agree a lot with of you. people. What's that, Tom? It well, also does it, help a lot of well, people. Which is like yeah. it's not black and white. It really is. Yeah. And that's what I've been using psychedelics for. Is for, is for um, psychological. Yeah. But. I'm actually very, I will say I'm actually very in support of what MAPS is doing with MDMA. Yeah, um, right. Because it's not actually a psychedelic, you know. It's going to be so dramatic that way that the yeah. more subtle aspect is going to be swamped. Well, MDMA is not is not a psychedelic. It's an empathogen, um, and um, it it has this uh, dramatic uh, uh, benefit for PTSD because it knocks out the fear factor. 
Um, it opens up the heart so you can have compassion to the situation that you wouldn't, couldn't face. Um, and it leaves you completely clear so that you can talk about it with your therapist. Yeah. Um, um, so I think there's immense potential there. And actually, this is just my own theory. I don't know if Rick Doblin, the head of MAPS, would even agree with him. <laughs> I think that there's a little bit of a tricky thing going on with him in that sense that his true mission is to have recognition and legalization for all the psychedelics. That's and MDMA is the, the, the most likely one to be the leading edge at this yes. time because it's not a true psychedelic. It can be produced exactly the same every time. And PTSD is something that the authorities can relate to and sympathize with. Yeah. yeah. This guy's been wanting to say something for a while. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, I just got out of the Air Force. Sorry, you got out of what? The Air Force. Uh huh. Yeah, I was in for 10 years. And as soon as I got out, I went and smoked, and the same thing happened to me. I overdosed. Ah. And was completely out on the floor. Luckily, I had brothers in Colorado. Yeah. Who sort of said, hey, we need to calm down, not let you. Yeah. Smoke this much because it's been ten years since yeah. I didn't touch the plant. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I had and, rules when I was in. Yeah. And, and you were in Colorado when you smoked at the first. The well, first you know they've been like working on it. Yeah, like, they've been working on it ten years. And my yeah. brothers were really, really good with it. But yeah. um, as far as the PTSD, this concept of of delving into something and, and hurting yourself, I know what that feels like because I did the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I had to come back, and I had to exercise it again, and had to remind myself that I'm my own best teacher. Yes. And no one's going to understand this, you know, wonderful thing. It's a plant. It's an ally. It's been here as long as we have. Yeah, yeah. And we have to learn how to talk to it. Yeah. Uh, when I was in the military, I was a linguist, a cryptological linguist. I dealt with, nice. I dealt with symbols. That's um, awesome. Um, I also worked in the technological fields a lot. Um, I did what's called network engineering administration so i see a big huge revolution that is coming on the tech side and if we don't get spiritually equipped to it it is going to override us um and that's not to scare anybody that's sit there and say hey you know this is scary on both sides and i know what it feels like to be in this new world of psychedelics when it was pretty much barred for me mm -hmm. and it has helped me and has put my mind into such a wonderful place and my question for you is i also am a big martial artist you work a lot with Qigong and Tai Chi. And just like um, stretching out those meridians in yoga and clearing that mind and getting yourself into a pure focus, do you think that using that width or in conjunction, what is the timing that would you use? Would you use it before your practice, during your practice, oh. or after? Yeah, good question. Can you um, it? You're talking about specific, what was that, Jeremy? Can you repeat the question? Oh, um, he's recording, yeah. So. This gentleman is asking uh, if I understood it correctly that if you're using cannabis in conjunction with, are you talking about say martial arts practices in yeah, particular? Arts, you're, you're, okay. You're going through the form in a yeah. very meditative way, slow. You know, Tai Chi is a yeah. slow meditative form, um, um, sort of like yoga. Is. Yeah. So the question is, you know, uh, when might you do that in conjunction, like chronologically, like have the cannabis first or during okay. or whatever yeah so um, well I don't to be honest I don't think there's a hard and fast answer to that I'd, I certainly wouldn't see a problem with uh, um, say for example um, starting with a meditation um, two of the guys that um, have contributed to the book Sean and Steve oh excuse me I gotta move I hope it doesn't throw this thing off too much but I've been sitting on my knees for 45 minutes um, uh, uh, when they, when they smoke cannabis, um, not always, sometimes they're looser with it, uh, the first thing they do is they sit in meditation for 20 minutes before they have any conversation. They just sit in silence and really connect with it. And then if they're going to have a conversation about something or work, work with it, that's, I, I don't know if you were here when I mentioned Steve Dyer, he's one of those two guys. He, he said it's really important to know what you're going to do with that plant because if it's amp of its amplification capability, uh, you can direct that energized quality, right? So if you, if you kind of connect with the plant, I'm just making this up as I go along at the moment um, in terms of your question. If you connect with the plant first, 
um, you know, sit down and meditate with it for 10 or 20 minutes, you know. Um, uh, maybe if you feel like it, maybe do a little bit of yoga stretching or something just to loosen the body up. Um, but really, just as much as possible, get out of your head and be silent with it. Then you've established that relationship, and then perhaps a natural thing would be to rise into the movement. It's, that's kind of a guess, but that's my sense of how it might be effective in conjunction with something like you're talking about. Uh, I've been taking Taekwondo lately, and I find that doing, you know, taking a brownie about an hour before I get there mm. just makes the whole thing, no matter what it is that I'm doing there, yeah. that's what I'm doing. That's great. Everything so, else so just my, kind of goes away. <clears throat> yeah. My experience is uh, kind of similar, but uh, so the physiology of it, the, heart, the increased heart rate, yeah. and the um, acceleration of things, so I... I smoke, and pretty soon I'm just wanting to move around. Mm -hmm. Then I listen to some psychedelic music, aesthetic music, some dance music, and then I'm just moving. And I'm just getting the best workout ever. Yeah, doing yoga or dance, or just you can really kick your ass. Even without without the plant, I've had serious meditation, almost visions, um, and going through these forms. Mm -hmm. Just because it's an ancient form, and studying this in conjunction with how the ancients looked at that form. Um, it's really deep. It's just when I'm looking at it in conjunction with cannabis, I don't want it to sort of alter that. Hmm. Yeah, well, you know, that's, you know, as I, as I keep liking to say, it's the people's plant, and, you know, we can do whatever we want with it or not, you know, as long as we're respectful, and we can experiment and find out for ourselves. For ourselves. We're, uh, we're at a point in the culture um, where um, we're sort of at the bottom, you know? Yes. Like, these plants have been vilified for a long time. The link to the past has been cut for the most part. And, uh, 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 and cannabis is safe enough of a plant to work with that way that um, I think this is a time, historically speaking, to, um, for people to um, be experimental um, and find out how it's best going to work in conjunction with other practices and other activities, you know. I think in general, the less mind going on, you know, the best, less thinking going on, um, you know, is good. Like, um, for example, um, there's a little bit of discussion about cannabis and creativity in the book. Um, and I, I, I wrote a little introductory chapter, and then I had two people write about, their, two artists write about their own use of cannabis in their work. And in my little bit, I said, you know, um, you could take the view that um, uh, creativity and spirituality are not separate, right? That, you know, that true creativity is, you know, kind of like downloading the muse or whatever, and it's all spiritual in that sense. Um, so, um, uh, <coughs> excuse me, then this fellow named Floyd Salas, who's an award-winning writer, wrote a chapter for the book, and he said um, uh, that he always writes under the influence. Um, but he said, before I do that, he said, what that, uh, okay, so before he, he does that, he does his research, he does all his study, and and takes notes and everything like that. But when it comes to act, he's done all that prep and then he's sitting down to do the writing, he has a toke or two. And he said what that does is open him up and, and um, connects him to his, uh, what you were talking about, like the love, you know, within him. And he said, I, I, I smoke pot to love so that I can write. Um, so, um, uh, you know, it's all about us just finding out how we can work with this plant if we even want to, you know. I mean, I'm I'm not trying. I'm not proselytizing. I'm, I'm, I'm I, I don't care on some level whether people use it or not. I think it can be a benefit if we use it wisely, and I think it can have a big influence on the culture if enough people learn how to use it wisely. But for any individual, who knows, you know. In fact, some people are so sensitive that that they're already connected in that sense. I would say, you know, you even just said that something like that yourself, and you said. That um, and and I've I've heard this from a, a number of people with other entheogens, that um, once you've connected with that, the the spirit of that medicine, you don't necessarily need the medicine anymore, you know, uh, because you have a relationship with the spirit of it. That may be true in my case. Like it's the same that I had 45 years ago. Yeah. And it came back, and I can't and I can't remember if it was if it was key when I started smoking weed. It's about the time yeah. to legalize it here. Yeah. At least when I started smoking it. So there may be something to that too. Yeah. I mean, well, you know, like the, a lot of the ayahuasca arrows, they're doing ayahuasca ceremonies five, ten, fifteen times a month, you know. And I've talked to some of these guys, and and they'll they'll just have a little bit, and it just zones them right in. You yeah, know? I'm only yeah. drinking about a month for one of those uh, <laughs> a week long things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, good luck. Um, in, one, in Joan Bellow's book, she actually talks about being 
locked up for marijuana back in the day and um, sitting with the plant spirit in prison. Mm, yeah. I read the book, but I forgot that part. Yeah. 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 <laughs> what is her book called again? Her book? The Benefits of Marijuana, Spiritual, Psychological, and something else, Medicinal, maybe? Yeah. I, yeah. I think it's really interesting that, that it's female. That's what's so cool about it, because it's, that, that's always been known as a female. Sophia was something that was a female, but she's been gone for a long time. Mm -hmm. Nobody hears about her, but she. everybody reads about her in these uh, uh, near-death experiences. When they feel like they're they're feeling like uh, that that love and they're being carried to the next uh -huh. that's 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 the same love that's the same to me that is the same female that is that is involved in these plants. Uh -huh. Yeah. And most of the plants that we imbibe in are females, so yeah, it's actually a female plant, yeah. it isn't it? <laughs> Indeed. But, but more than just being an actual female plant, because ayahuasca doesn't have a male and female plant, right, for example, you know, or the, the vine, it's just one, it's not a female. How do you prepare ayahuasca? Um, oh, well, uh, it's actually quite a complex process, and one of the favorite psychedelic stories that, you know, people know is that, um, that gets told in almost any book about ayahuasca is that all over the Amazon, people who for thousands of years never met each other, they didn't have email, you know, <laughs> or whatever, telephones or anything, found same two plants, independent of each other, apparently, as far as anyone can tell, because um, uh, it takes at least two plants. There can be other plants, uh, admixtures, but it's it requires two plants because the vine um, uh, uh, by itself uh, contains harmaline, I think it is, Tom? Yeah. yeah. Which has some psycho psych psychoactive effect, but not powerful. Um, but the other plant, the, um, the, the um, uh, dimethyltryptamine containing, DMT containing plant, the Chacruna, Psychotra viridis, and some others, but those are the primary ones, um, uh, contains a powerful uh, component of uh, DMT, but it's orally inactive in the stomach. Um, it's, it's deactivated in, our, in the stomach because of something called monoamine oxidase. Is that how it's pronounced? Monoamine oxidase, MAO. But the vine has an MAO inhibitor, which then allows the DMT to go to work. And so the researchers go down there, you know, the Dennis McKenna's of the world, and these people go down there and they say, how did you guys find that? And they say, oh, well, the spirits told us. <laughs> go get this plant, go get this plant, yeah. Um, so then what you do is you combine those plants and you brew it for a really long time. I don't know. Uh, it probably varies. I don't know. I, 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 I the right one. Yeah. Um, there's probably recipes in books somewhere, but, but there's a lot more to it to do it right, you know, um, because it's not just a mechanical process. Um, for example, I have a book at home called Rainforest Medicine. Ever seen that one, Tom? I think it's a really good book. He spent 30 years with, with uh, indigenous people in um, Colombia, and he said that he watched the way they do it, and um, they, they treat every single stage of the process from the very, very beginning of the growing of the vine until the final result um, as a sacred, very careful, reverent activity, and they will only like harvest it in certain conditions and at certain times, and even stuff that you might think is just kind of superstitious, like if a if a dog walks was it a dog if a dog black dog or something or a dog walks across the path of it while they're taking it from A to B, they'll throw it out, you know, the stuff like that. That that's regardless of whether there's any sort of real basis to that, the it, it indicates the care and respect that they show to it, and so. That's one of the themes with these plants that even comes into it with cannabis. And, you know, you've been around that aspect of cannabis. Maybe you feel connected to the plant in that way yourself. But one of the chapters in the book is on sacred growing. And the person who wrote that chapter says that um, uh, the love and care that you put into that plant at every stage of the growing will have a, an actual um, manifest effect on the on the user of the plant, and he said he's found that over and over again when he shares some of his own grown stuff um, with friends that have not tried it before. They go, "Wow, that is totally different from anything I've ever smoked before." So, I, you know, that that's another issue too. You know, um, like what's going into the plant, both you know mechanically, chemically, and spiritually. You know, yeah. yeah. I have a question. So there's a lot of talk about pesticides and things like that being sprayed on the plant, and I don't know if that might have something to do with maybe I think that's also possible. Or um, I kind of 
just what you think about that in terms of using the plant in spiritual practices and if I were the dictator of the world, um, uh, I would absolutely insist that all cannabis be grown organically. You're just adding one more element that you don't actually know because it's already a complex plant, you know. Um, uh, they're working hard on it in Canada right now because we're about to go federally legal, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, the Globe and Mail, our national newspaper, did a, a study of uh, the cannabis dispensaries in Toronto. And they, 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 they tested samples from, I think, 13. Or, or they, I don't know how many they did, but I think they found uh, samples of cannabis from 13 different dispensaries that had um, banned pesticides in them, uh, molds, um, and they also did not um, uh, match their claims about the THC content. Um, uh, so that's a big issue that we're working on in Canada right now. You know, is um, uh, what I would like to see. I mean, just in a visionary sense, not necessarily. I don't know what the logistics are. Um, what I would like to see is that there be some kind of um, uh, trustable um, organic certification. You know, um, is there a cheap and easy way you can test every strength, every batch? That's the problem. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's the problem. They're talking about that in Oregon. <clears throat> Because the testing is so expensive now with everything they've added to yes. it. Yeah. And, you know, the number of tests that you have to do with mm -hmm. each um, batch yeah. that um, they're talking about if you pass, you know, ten times in a row, then you then you get a fly on it. You get to go without testing or with minimal yeah. testing where they randomly test you after that. But everybody's got to establish a record mm. to begin with, yeah. it, which makes sense. Yeah, there's lots of different ways. Unfortunately, yeah. you know, I can see the issues yeah. of the multiple samples if we're talking about flowers, but when you extract, everything's in the same pot. So mm -hmm. taking it from the left side of the pot and the right side of the pot and the center of the pot, yeah. I mean, it doesn't make any difference because it's all the same anyway. But yeah. at any rate, all that stuff's being worked out. Well, you know, what? if I'm not mistaken, um, isn't random inspection a common practice in many industries? I mean, you don't inspect everything. But if, right. if somebody knows that there's a good chance they're going to come by eventually and check right. you, then you're going to try to keep it straight, right? So maybe it could work like that, you know, where they just... Eventually, but there's kind of got to be a starting place. For instance, if you go to California, yeah. every, every single sample that went into, I can't remember what... Um, what cup it was, but every single sample was tainted with, tainted with pesticides. Uh -huh. and, and it's because they, they haven't really had testing yeah. in Cali, you know, really um, can't, hash oil, you know, you're not supposed to manufacture it down there, so it makes everything rather complex. So we're kind of starting from a negative spot to begin uh -huh. with, and hopefully, you know, there and there is a big difference between what's been grown in Cali and the same kind of tests that were run in Oregon didn't turn out to be anywhere near as dirty as what happened in California, so it just depends on the area. But when we go legal in Canada, I'm going to start growing my own, and I'm not going to put any pesticides on it. Exactly. Uh, yes. <laughs> we, we only have about five minutes left. Okay. Uh, so you want to ask your he gets question. the final question, and uh, then if you want to just close us out with uh, something, sure, um, yeah, that'd be great. And okay, thank sure. You. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. So, yeah. So um, my my question was about you, you had mentioned earlier something along the lines of uh, the difference between mushrooms and marijuana and everything. Um, in my experience, when like the first time I I tried mushrooms on purpose, yeah, uh, I. I mixed it with marijuana. A friend told me that that would make it easier. Yeah. Um, and that was like a mind-bending experience. But I noticed that since then, mm -hmm. uh, whenever I smoke marijuana, mostly the stuff with uh, THC in it, I find it really easy to recall my experiences with mushrooms. Oh yeah. And that sensation and everything. Is that a normal thing, or is that am I just making that up? What is that? Everything's normal in my view. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't know to be honest. Okay. Well, yeah. is there like some sort of spiritual significance to that from your? Not that I've ever heard of. Okay. No. No. I mean, maybe it's just opened up some channels in you that weren't open before. You know. I think that's very possible. Yeah. In the Absolutely. sporting world, Absolutely. lots of times they uh, link movement patterns together using exactly those same principles. It's possible that, that that's yeah. part of what's going on. And the so association is the best method in, technique. Yeah, right. in the, in the athletic world, in the sports uh, world, the that those kinds of things are used yeah, yeah, to enhance performance. And 
I'm thinking that, that you just keyed into it without even realizing it. I'm thinking, I don't know. So it sounds like we have to round up now. Do we have to actually be out of the building right now? Uh, we have to be out by 9 and I have to clean everything up. So. Oh, okay. So um, uh, maybe if people want to talk to me anymore, uh, you know, uh, I, yeah, I can talk one-on-one uh, -on -one with them. Yeah, yeah. sure. There's, there's yeah. like a whole lounge area right here. Okay. I just, you know, in a few minutes want to just at least start sure. picking up. But if you wouldn't mind leading us out uh, with uh, something... A closing argument of sorts. Well, I think I, 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 I said it already, you know, when I was monologuing earlier, so okay. I, I, I don't want to repeat myself. I would just be repeating myself, actually. So I'm just glad that you came and that we had this discussion. Thank you very much for your participation you in this. Yeah, yeah. What's the highest you on just marijuana? <laughs> oh, please. Uh, Okay, I'm going to do a slightly roundabout answer on this because this less is more thing can also apply to how frequently you do the plant, and that's addressed in the book as well. Um, and um, one of Mariano da Silva, who's an ayahuasca shaman and a cannabis shaman as well, um, says that he tries to always leave like about a week in between times because the effects are deeper and sharper and <coughs> transcendent, transcendental effect that he he says I don't. You don't experience that at all if I do it every day, you know. So I had an experience just recently um, where I was out, out of Canada. I was in Florida I, uh, visiting my dad for two weeks. And I hadn't smoked for a few days before and a few days after. So it was like three weeks of nothing. Um, and then I had the same stuff that I'd had um, been smoking, um, you know, strong commercial stuff that I got in Vancouver. And um, it was uh, it was very um, it, I was uh, with my eyes closed. I was having uh, vi visual experiences that were almost as clear and intense as ayahuasca experiences. Um, but I'm not probably the best person to direct that question to because I know a lot of other people have had far more um, intense and bizarre experiences than I have on cannabis. Yeah. Um, uh, you ever heard of the Hash Club of France, the Hashish Club? Uh, it was leading intellectuals and writers from Paris in the 18. 50s, Tom, early mm -hmm. 50s, yeah, gathered together at the home of a rich friend of theirs. See, I knew I was born in the wrong time. Yeah, uh, Emil Zola, Charles Baudelaire, a number of these people, um, uh, and this, uh, th they had um, they had uh, big gooey balls of hashish from the Middle East, that, from, I don't know, Turkey or someplace like that, and they would put it in their coffee and then have this meal, and then they would down these things. And in the book, they describe some of the experiences. Uh, one guy said he was sitting alone in the living room, uh, and there were gargoyles coming out of the fireplace with his eyes open. Another guy said he tried to walk up the spiral staircase, and um, it took him, he said, I'm not, ex he said, I'm not exaggerating, it, took, it felt like a thousand years. Um, people have had the most bizarre, extreme distortions on cannabis. You have to be, uh, when you take it orally, you have to, I think, be really, really careful with that. Um, <laughs> But it also, okay, so to answer your question directly, uh, for me, it wasn't overwhelming experiences, but I've had experiences where I felt like I did, in fact, sort of land in that timeless place of, 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 of deep peace. You know, it was short. You know, usually my ego comes in and goes, oh, well, we can't stay here. You know, we've got to make things, <laughs> stir things up again. <laughs> but uh, I have had that. Um, uh, and myself and other people have had experiences where they felt like the, the love was opened right up. The heart, the compassion was opened right up. This gentleman that just left a while ago talked about that too. So I'm not necessarily the best example of that, but I know that it, I know from a combination of my own experiences, from reading and from talking to a lot of people, that um, in the right circumstances, uh, it's possible to have. Well, Terence McKenna said something like that too. He said, you know, this plant is capable of almost the full spectrum of uh, psychedelic effects. You know, in the right circumstances uh, of any of the entheogens. Yeah. Anyway, we better stop there. Ooh, yeah. No, and I'll we chat. Have any, any more questions? Happy I to talk uh, yeah, yeah. one on one or one on two or one on three. Uh, you know. But maybe we should actually formally break now so that mm -hmm. we can get out of here on time. Yeah. Uh, yep. yeah. Thanks, yeah. Thank you all for coming to so much. Please check out.